Okay, Jakob Bakema, 1914-1981. Uh, he was born on March 8, 1914. Uh, very important uh, Dutch architect. Uh, he didn't work alone. He had a partner, but we'll, we'll talk about both. Let me say a few words about him. Uh, this was the man. Uh, and uh, um, he meant a lot for, for, uh, for uh, modern architecture. I have seen, uh, unfortunately, only one building by him with my own eyes, so to speak, in Berlin, uh, an apartment building, uh, an excellent one. So Jakob Berend ja Jap Bakema, as you see, was born on March 8th, 1914, was a Dutch modernist architect notable for design of public housing and involvement in the reconstruction of Rotterdam after the Second World War. As you probably know, Rotterdam was, was uh, violently uh, affected by uh, the bombings of the Second World War, as opposed to Amsterdam. Amsterdam was lucky, but Rotterdam was not. Yet Rotterdam now is, 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 is a flourishing uh, city and some even call it the city of the future. Born in Groningen, Bakema studied at the Groningen Higher Technical College and the Academy of Architecture in Amsterdam, where he studied, among others, with Mars Stam. In 1946, he began attending meetings of the Congrès International d'Architecture Moderne, became its secretary in 1955, and was a core member of its offshoot Team 10. Uh, these, 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 these names uh, evoke, uh, uh, you know, a certain time in architecture. Uh, I would call it the, the heroic modernism of those years. From 1948 onward, Bakema worked with the, the Van den Broek, Broek in the architectural firm Van den Broek and Bakema. They collaborated to design landmarks and neighborhoods in Rotterdam and around the Netherlands and participated in the 1957 Interbau project in Berlin. That's exactly where I saw the apartment building that they built, a remarkable colony uh, constellation of uh, buildings built by very important architects from Alvar Alto to Oscar Niemeyer to Bakema uh, to Gropius, and even Le Corbusier built a, a United Habitation in Berlin, but not on the very site where the Bakema building is. In 1964, Bakema became a professor at Delft University of Technology, and in 1965 became a professor of Staatliche Hochschule in Hamburg. Okay, so here is uh, Bakema, uh, younger. He was not you see, we have now this uh, um, differentiation between architects and urbanists. But I think a good architect can also do good urbanism. Although, of course, uh, Le Corbusier might contradict us because of his controversial uh, Ville Radieuse. But still, uh, even if that, that project, urban project by Le Corbusier was criticized by certain people, we cannot deny its uh, creativity, its ingenuity, and its good intentions, in fact. Um, so, in my opinion, and it's not just my opinion, there are other people who think in the same way, a good architect could do um, urbanism, could do interior design, could do object design, and often the best of them do all of the above. Bakema was also an urbanist. He, he, I mean, you can see right behind him uh, an urban planning. And so, but he was also able to design uh, uh, buildings. Uh, and uh, I think we need, we need to open up to, to escape uh, excessive specialization because I think excessive specialization could, uh, could um, uh, affect negatively uh, you know, the dialogue between various branches of, 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 of architecture. And, and that is not a good thing, I think. Uh, even Walter Gropius was uh, rather sarcastic about specialization when he said, the specialists are those who always repeat the same mistakes uh, ad infinitum. And uh, 
I don't know if it's entirely true, but obviously show the, 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 the irritation uh, Gropius had with, uh, with excessive specialization with the so-called specialists. Uh, Bakema was a generalist, and I think most good architects are, are, are exactly that, generalists. And it's not uh, necessary to go back in history to well-known examples like Alberti, who was a polymath and did so many things, uh, and not to mention the others, no, uh, Bernini, uh, Michelangelo, uh, uh, even Bramante, Brunelleschi, they all practice various kinds of uh, related, interrelated fields. And architecture was in a way the, the queen of the arts. It was the culmination of bringing together various fields that connected with it. Um, so, Vandenberg uh, and, uh, and Bakema, uh, here they are, sorry for the resolution of the, of, of, of the photograph, but you can still uh, uh, see or barely see, you can, you can see, you know, two men uh, devoted uh, to the, the exciting uh, exercising of, of, of architecture, almost being childlike, you know, because because creativity does this. You, when you work on something that is exciting, uh, uh, you become like a child in a way. You even forget to eat and to sleep even at, for, for a while at least. And I, I think it's very, very important to, 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 to underline the importance of creativity and to escape the, the, the deadening uh, effects of, uh, of uh, excessive concern with the so-called regulations. Uh, of course, they, are, they need to be respected to an extent, but as, um, um, as, uh, as an interesting architect who practices, still, he's still alive in Israel, uh, Tzvi Hacker said, Tzvi Hacker said, a great building has to be illegal. <laughs> I mean, he put it in a humorous way, but but I think in a way he's right that a great building doesn't, doesn't pay too much attention to all the restrictions that a certain judicial or I don't know what system uh, uh, claims uh, to be unavoidable. On the other hand, Louis Kahn differentiated between rules and uh, laws. Usually we use the word law to, uh, to name a rule. Uh, Kahn said a rule is made by man, the human being, and the law is made by God, is divine. But we take the regulations invented by human beings, it doesn't matter with good intentions or with less good intentions, but they are made by human beings and we call them laws. But are, are they really laws? I mean, you know, they have inevitably uh, a percentage of, uh, of, of uh, imperfection, which is uh, uh, almost unavoidable uh, because they were produced by human beings. In fact, even if they are produced by God or were produced by God, I would say they, they, they would be not quite perfect because, I mean, sorry for this uh, maybe um, sacrilegious statement, but is creation truly perfect? I, I don't think it is. Uh, sorry, why does the fish, big fish, eat the small fish? Why does the, 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 the wolf uh, eat the deer? You know, there are so many injustices in nature that you wonder, you know, couldn't, could, I mean, why do we have uh, toothaches? You know, the toothache in itself shows that creation was not perfect. Anyway, sorry for this, uh, you know, rather humorous, I hope, um, um, side uh, comments. Uh, um, this shopping promenade from 1950 in Rotterdam, uh, which is still uh, appetizing, if I can say so, if we look at it, you know, it's, it, it still looks like a very inviting um, urban uh, space. Uh, and, uh, you know, some years passed since it was made, but, but uh, its modernism is still fresh. Why is it fresh? Because its principles are still fresh. You know, this is not about fashion. It's not about, of course, the, you know, there was something in the air, 
so to speak. But but this is a promenade that uh, uses healthy um, concepts, if I am to use this word, which I rarely use, very rarely use, and, and those are applicable uh, today as well. Uh, and uh, well, this picture is not so good, but you can still see that it's an open, open uh, urbanism, that it is about communication. It is about uh, walking, uh, you know, safely uh, without cars, uh, you know, disturbing your wandering, uh, you know, through these shops and, and so on. So it, it's, an, uh, it's a quality urban space that uh, Van den Broek and, and, and Bakema uh, um, projected and built. Uh, so I, I actually like when, when I see an architect doing uh, an urban scheme because the creativity of the architect can, can help urbanism uh, uh, significantly. And I, I, I would prefer uh, um, an architect who makes mistakes in the name of creativity than a bureaucrat who doesn't make mistakes, who respects all the rules and regulations, but, but in the end creates so-called create something that is dead or um, dry. We don't need that. After all, who were the, the urbanists of the Middle Ages? Those very, very charming cities and towns of the medieval times that we all admire when we, we were able to travel to Italy or I don't know where, you know, they didn't have, you know, incredible uh, dogmatic uh, codes. Of course, their lives were simpler. They didn't have uh, so many things that we have to handle, but still we can learn something from the middle ages that the charm of the old towns and the old cities where the so-called imperfections of life are not avoided, uh, but exactly those imperfections are, uh, are giving uh, character and charm to, 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 to the place. Our so-called scientific urbanism leads so very often to, to, to dead so-called solutions. Here we see uh, something that, that, that encourages uh, human interaction. And now, of course, uh, my words are a little bit uh, questionable now because of the pandemic but the pandemic let's hope is a, is a, is a, is an accident that one day will pass in in normal conditions human beings like to gather like like to be together like to uh, create uh, groups and this is what we see here very much so um, so anyway this was done by van den Broek and Bakema I don't know exactly what their roles their respective roles were in the uh, practicing architecture and urbanism, but I, I imagine they, they uh, collaborated very well. Rotterdam is an astonishing city. Uh, I, I have a presentation just about Rotterdam because uh, I, I find it very, very inspiring the way it was able to, to, to re-emerge from the ashes of the Second World War. And even now it has very important architectural firms. It's, it's a very dynamic city, uh, very much open to experiments. And uh, as such, I think it is an inspiration for, uh, for the whole world. And I was wondering, you know, why is it that the Dutch have such remarkable architects and artists? You know, I mean, I can mention now easily just from my head, uh, 10, 20 uh, artists and architects of the highest rank. And it's, it's a country that it has a population a little bit uh, smaller than the population of Romania. They are very close. One third of the country is under the level of the sea. They don't have the natural uh, riches that we do. And yet this country is, is leading the world in, in many, many ways and in architecture, certainly. And, 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 and why is it so? There must be an answer to this. Well, somebody said that it's because uh, Ro um, Rotterdam, not Rotterdam, but the Netherlands uh, is situated where it is. You know, there are the crossroads there you know, in the heart of, the, of Europe, um, they, they have to be, I mean, it has to be a dynamic society. 
but they are good at so many things, you know, even in soccer, you know, even in football. And uh, I think they have ambition, but they have this openness, you know, they, they experiment and they, they are not dogmatic. Uh, I don't know, I admire them a lot. I actually, um, I, maybe I call them wrongly. I thought of calling them at one moment, at one time, uh, the Japanese of Europe because they experiment. And I'm thinking mainly about architecture. Now, in a way, the comparison is not appropriate because Japan also has uh, its own uh, very strict uh, hierarchical uh, relationships. And yet in architecture, at least through the singularity of some, of some achievements, they are uh, very uh, fruitfully uh, experimental. I, I would like to see this spirit everywhere, actually, you know, uh, this, this, this openness, you know. Now, Radio Netherlands uh, from 1956, 1961. So we are talking about works that are more than 60 years old. Um, yes, it is, a, you know, a rather unsurprising for us today in the 21st century modern architecture. But it's well done, and it, it, it still has a freshness, a vision, which I think is important for any building. This is the building that I saw uh, uh, in uh, part of the Interbau in Berlin. It's actually this one, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's excellent. Uh, I don't know who did this one. I don't know if, I don't think they, they did this one as well, but this one I know for sure. And it's it's yeah it's 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 a very interesting building. I don't know if I have on this presentation. I prepared it for two three years ago. I don't know if I have the plans, but because for someone who died, I will talk twice about that architect on the day of the birth and on the day of when that person died. So I will I will have the chance to improve to develop the presentation. No, it, it, it's, it's a block of flats, but you can tell, even if you don't see the plans, that there are non-conformist gestures here, and there is something dynamic, uh, and it is um, an interlocking of functions, you know, maybe duplexes, or uh, I, have to, I have to look at the plans. But I remember when I was there, I liked this building very much. You see, why is it that a building where the architect is good is recognizable immediately? Because, because it, it, touches, it touches your mind, it touches your heart, it, 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 it touches your eye, it, it tells you something because it is something creative uh, going on there. Uh, and I remember, I mean, in the close proximity of this building, uh, there is, I mean, not far away, uh, Oscar Niemeyer with an excellent apartment building and uh, Alvar Alto has a building and Walter Gropius and there are a few other architects. Uh, very interesting. So if the pandemic goes away, I suggest uh, for those who want to go to Berlin, not to forget Interbau. Uh, actually, Berlin had the wisdom to build three colonies, not one one in the 1930s, one in the 50s, this one, and one in the 80s. So Berlin had the wisdom and the inspiration to invite very important architects to build apartment buildings, usually, you know, uh, social housing, actually, uh, uh, experimentally. I mean, the, the riches that they received because of this uh, um, progressive uh, attitude vis-a-vis -vis social housing or housing in general, Berlin now has a constellation, in fact, three constellations of great buildings by great architects. Bravo to them. And it's something that any country can do if they only have the open mind that um, Berlin had. It adds a lot to the, to the, to the, uh, the architectural landscape of, of, of the city where they are built. So here we have the, uh, the plan is not uh, very easily uh, read, but uh, because of these uh, white lines on, 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 on black uh, background, but maybe you, you are able to decipher it better than I am. 
looking at it now. But you, you can tell that it's, 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 it's a creative scheme uh, that uh, eliminated unnecessary circulations. It's dense and as such, you know, perhaps less expensive than otherwise it could have been. The, the pragmatism of the Dutch is something that, 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 uh, that uh, intrigues me, you know, because they are very pragmatic, but at the same time, strangely, their pragmatism becomes uh, almost romantic, so to speak, or, or, or uh, uh, yeah, uh, open. And uh, um, I don't know, instead of, instead of uh, generating, uh, uh, you know, a very, um, uh, you know, uh, limiting uh, uh, pragmatism, uh, their attitude in architecture at least, but and it's not just in architecture, is generating a, a, a repertoire of uh, unbelievable, uh, uh, you know, possibilities. So and here you, we can see better. It's, it's a very, very fine uh, plan, you know, very, I mean, you can tell that here there was a vision, you know, it, it's not the conventional apartment building, but it worked. It has a clarity of mind uh, and uh, the willfulness to create something that, that is uh, uh, valuable and, and not expensive. It's nice to contemplate human ingenuity, you know, uh, when, uh, whenever and however it manifests itself. Uh, these plans can be easily uh, read. So uh, there are there are floors at different levels within the apartments themselves. This is interesting. So I think it's a good idea to, to, to differentiate on, on different planes uh, the day functions from the night functions within one apartment unit. Now, uh, the, the, the city hall in Marl from 1960 to 1965, um, well, what can we say? Maybe this looks a little bit dated, but maybe not. I mean, there, there is a complexity here, although one might say that is not the spectacular, uh, you know, display of forms that some of the, the architecture of today uh, sometimes arrives at, but still it, it's a quality architecture, you can tell. And even here there are uh, acrobatics, structural acrobatics, so to speak, because these cubes are elevated from the, from the ground and, uh, you know, supported by a single massive leg. It's a complex of buildings, actually. And uh, look at this, you know, that the structure is not uh, something uh, hidden or, or, or to, 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 to be uh, ignored. There is creativity here at the level of, 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 of the engineering or of the structure as well. And I like, uh, to be honest with you, I like uh, brutalism. And this is not maybe totally, maybe this building could be called uh, brutalist architecture. But in general, I think the brutalism of those years has a, a robust feeling behind it, which is not the lack of feeling at all. So maybe the word brutalismus or brutalism is not totally adequate. Because when we, when we think about the word brutal, we, we, we imply that uh, there is no feeling there. But I, I wouldn't say at all that the so-called brutalist architecture was without feeling. No, the best of it had in fact a lot of feeling. 
and look at this. Would you say that this is a building without feeling? No, but it's a robust feeling. It's a, there is a vivacity here. There is virility. Uh, there is a force in the good sense of the word. And uh, concrete, uh, concrete, uh, strangely, perhaps, I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright called concrete a conglomerate, and, and thus uh, he didn't like it very much, but he, he did use it, but not as much as, as other architects, and not as much as he could have. But he was rather critical about the concrete because he thought it was a conglomerate. But I think, I mean, it's not just Tadao Ando, you know, there are countless very important architects who, you know, uh, created a lot for architecture using concrete. Unfortunately, concrete is, uh, is a material, as you know, uh, related directly to the production of pollution. And this is a problem. But in terms of architectural expressivity, no one can, can deny that it has a great potential for it. I mean, we see an example right here. Le Fleur du Mal, the, um, the title of an important book by Charles Baudelaire, one of my favorite poets. I love Baudelaire. And this year, there are 200 years since his birth. Truly, truly a great, a great poet. Um, and a great critic as well. And it's not a common thing to have a great poet also doing great criticism. For example, Charles Baudelaire said that art has two halves. One half speaks about the transitory, the ephemeral, uh, the circumstantial, and the other half speaks about the eternal and the immutable. And good art needs both. And I would agree with, with Baudelaire. Good art needs both. And even Frank Gehry says the same thing. He said, uh, in, a, in an interview, he said architecture is supposed to belong to its time and its place, but should also be concerned with timelessness. In essence, he talked about exactly about the two halves of art that Baudelaire talked about. Town Hall of Vede, uh, 1965, 1976. Uh, what can I say? Um, Yes, this is horizontal, is long, is uh, but it has uh, an outgoing spirit, which which I like. The Aula Technical University of Delft, where he was also a professor from 1966. Now, this also we are dealing here with the architect as a sculptor, or with a sculptor as an architect. Uh, the sculptural qualities of architecture cannot be denied. Uh, architecture is not quite a sculpture as Brunkusch thought. Brunkusch thought that uh, uh, a building is an inhabitable sculpture. I th with all due respect and affection for Brunkusch, I don't think he named with sufficient precision the specificity of architecture. Architecture is different from sculpture. It benefits from sculptural qualities. There is no doubt. But I wouldn't go so far to say that architecture is an inhabitable sculpture. That's a little bit, I think, too easy, a little bit. But it is understandable, such a statement from, from a sculptor, I think. And there were great sculptors who were also great architects. Uh, should I mention Gian Bernini? Uh, but, uh, you know, what about Michelangelo and others? Even in uh, even Le Corbusier did the great sculptures. He was not a sculptor per se, but I love the sculptures, the, the highly chromatic sculptures of Le Corbusier. I think a, a great artist can do, I, 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 I even wonder, let's imagine Picasso was an, an architect as well. Let's imagine he built buildings. I would be very curious to see a Picasso architecture, for example. 
you know, he did, he even wrote poetry and plays, he did sculptures, he painted, he drew. I think he could have built as well. This is what I think. And I think probably many artists, or maybe not many, but at least some artists, those who are truly good, I think they can do architecture as well. Why don't we let them build? This is my question. Why doesn't society invest the artist with a trust so they can build? I think we would have some great surprises because I think artists, if they are genuine, if they are good, they could build sometimes very interesting buildings as they did in the history of architecture. But the bureaucracy of these times does not allow them to build. Although in Vienna, they did allow them to build. Hunter Wasser was a painter and uh, Fritz Wotruba a sculptor. And the church that Fritz Wotruba built on a hill uh, in Vienna is one of the most remarkable buildings of Vienna. And the buildings of Hunterwasser are also uh, touristic destinations of the highest order. So there, two artists who built, who were architects because the Viennese society allowed them to also be architects. But this is not happening in all the countries, unfortunately. But one thing is for sure, here Bakema and Van den Broek were sculptors as well, in a way. This is a very sculptural building, at least this part of the building. And they handled concrete quite convincingly again. Bravo to them. It's, it's refreshing. It is, a, 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 it is an encouragement to live and to be creative when you see an architecture which is itself creative and open and uh, experimental. Uh, whatever Peter Zumthor might, might, might have said, architecture can transform life and society. You, I, I wouldn't be so skeptical. Yes, maybe it cannot save life, architecture, but it can improve it. It, it, it can give you an impetus to continue to live. It can encourage you to, to, I don't know, it gives you oxygen, so to speak. Although architecture, when coming into being, is actually cutting down trees often. And so it takes away from the oxygen. But uh, beyond this paradox, uh, a good artwork and a good building is giving you spiritual oxygen, so to speak. Uh, although it takes away sometimes the other oxygen. Now, I don't know why this little dog is staring at me right now or at us, uh, but the building is still gloriously asserting the powers of architecture, I think. And doesn't matter how you look at it, it's still interesting. Look at this. Yes, the vision of two architects that became flesh, concrete flesh or flesh in concrete. It's fine. And it's fine 60 years or so after it's, or, you know, 50, 60 years after it's being built. Now, who says uh, that brutalism is, uh, is, uh, is uh, brutal is wrong? No, brutalism is not brutal when it is at its best. No, when it is at its best, it is uh, provoking emotional reactions but uh, not of pain or fear or anything. No, it's, it's a vivacity of vision, which is important. Now, another building for Delft from 1970. This one, I think, had a, I mean, it seems obvious uh, there was a fire there. Uh, it happens. Architecture is vulnerable. Doesn't matter how many um, precautions you take, it's still vulnerable. Uh, sorry, some of these pictures need uh, better quality. I hope I will improve this presentation for the next one on Bakema, and it will come the time. The Rat House of, in this town, 10, 10, 1973. Look at this. Now, who would say that this building is still not uh, relevant to architecture? I think it is. And uh, you wonder why, how is it possible? Well, it's exactly because art, and I include architecture here as well in this context, has those two halves that Charles, Charles Baudelaire spoke about. So it's not just about fashion, something that is uh, valuable and authentic 
uh, today, it, it, it would continue to be so even 100 years from now, and even a longer time. I like this building. I wish uh, we had in our country such uh, you know, city halls. The clarity of vision, you, 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 you can tell, it is here. You know, if you live in one of these apartments here, and you go to the city hall, you know, you go, I don't know, the building is inspiring you, you trust it, it's solid, but it has variety, it's exciting and inciting uh, uh, visually. It's important to make a building that, uh, that, uh, that doesn't leave you indifferent. And it has a level of honesty. This is also important because an, a building which has honesty it, which is built honestly uh, is encouraging you as a user or a, as a visitor to trust that you will find honesty within the building. The building is telling you this, you know, I am built honestly, you can see how I am built, you see the materials I am built with, and this generates trust. Good work. Now a reformed church, 1954, 1958. Look at this. Why is it we don't build in the country we are in churches like this? To me, it's a terrible, terrible, terrible loss. You know, so many churches were built, but, but most of them without any architectural value, including the big cathedral, which is now approaching its uh, construction process. We don't even know who the architect is. It is unbelievable, actually. How come, you know, when we look at Rome or uh, Florence or all those cities in Barcelona, where you name them, you know, the church used the greatest architects to build buildings for, for it, for the church, but not in our country. In our country, we don't even know who the architects were, if indeed they, there were architects. I mean, for me, things are not complicated. If God was, if, if uh, the human being was made, uh, uh, you know, respecting the, I mean, uh, in uh, some kind of, uh, uh, I don't know how to say, I, uh, uh, meaning, you know, if the human being was made, uh, you know, uh, resembling God, and if God was and is creative, shouldn't the human being also be creative? Is the best way, actually, I think, to, to honor the relationship between you and God. But when you are not creative, you are betraying your very raison d'etre. To me, things are very simple. And not only that you are betraying your raison d'etre, but you are also betraying God. If you are not creative, this is an insult to the one who created you and who wanted you to be like him. If I am to speak, uh, you know, uh, quoting... Uh, Imperf imperfectly from from the from the Bible. Anyway, it's a fine church, and even the children seem to like it. And you would say this is not a church; this is a kindergarten. Even better, a church which gives the feeling, a, a church where the children are joyous, is a good church in terms of architecture. I would say. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't understand why the, the Orthodox uh, Christian Church doesn't understand that, 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 that the building should be indeed creative. Otherwise, we are betraying the very beneficiary of the building. That is God himself. It's supposed to be the house of God. No? And if God is creative, then his house should be creative as well. And it is not. It, it's just a... Uh, infuriating situation here in the East, really is. <laughs> anyway, the Central Library in Rotterdam, 1980. Look at this. It really fills my heart with joy and my eye with joy because I see unconventional people, people who are not dogmatic, who create a building which is a living organism. Look at this. Yes, maybe there are some parts which are connected with the time when it was built, but thank God it was not yet, uh, and it didn't become, and it didn't even have the, the, 
the tendency to become a so-called postmodern building. This is a modern, modernistic structure, courageously displaying the ducts, the pipes, colorfully uh, uh, present, as they should be. Uh, and uh, what can I say? It's a yes said to life. That's what it is. The building says yes to life. Yes, also to technology. Yes, also to air conditioning. Yes, also to whatever at that time was considered and maybe still is vital to the well functioning of a building. But there is also the element of playfulness. What I see in the great works of architecture and in the great works in, in anything, writing, uh, poetry or composing music or anything that is creative is done by uniting work with play. You cannot do work that is creative without playing. You have to do both. I mean, Einstein, who was a scientist and was not a, a poet, even had the, the, the audacity to say, playing is the best research. Now that, you know, wouldn't it be beautiful if the doctoral papers were done with a playing spirit? Would be great. Unfortunately, most of them are not done in this way and they are condemned to being so-called non-scientific if they allow themselves to also be joyous. Because you cannot have art and architecture and anything creative where there is no joy. You have to have joy. And there is joy in these pipes. And I, th I would say even that uh, uh, tower uh, of that old church smiles uh, um, uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with affection towards these, these pipes, which are saying yes to life. And the interior also, yes, there is functionalism, there, are, there is uh, you know, uh, the comfort of the escalators, but there is all the dynamic space. And look, uh, you know, these, uh, these uh, rotated, rotated cubes, which in some parts of the world would, would, would have never been built and would never be built, but the, the, the open-minded Dutch did build them uh, right in the center of Rotterdam. And this is the library and bravo to them, really, uh, bravo to them. I, I salute them. Radical pedagogies, he talked about radical pedagogies and he applied them would be so great to have radical pedagogies ourselves, wherever we are in this world. Look at him. I'm sure they loved him. They loved the professor, you know, they, uh, well, yes, there was a time, you know, the 60s, the end of the 60s, the beginning of the 70s, when there was something in the air, the students fought for against uh, banks, against wars, they fought for love. They wanted to, to transform the world. It didn't last for too long, that, that spirit, it's true. But there was something then, there, you know. And these people were animated by an idealism, which now I do not see. Uh, I don't know why I put this. Um, yeah, there is a website. This is the website. You can photograph it, or I can send it to you, where you find more things about the radical pedagogies of Bakema. Okay, so now we go, so happy birthday, Bakema, and now we'll go to an um, uh, interesting artist. This presentation is uh, shorter on uh, Ansel Kiefer, because it is his birthday as well. And I thought that architects should know about art, contemporary art as well. And Ansel Kiefer is one of the most important ar artists today, and not totally uh, uninterested in architecture, as you will see. So he is today 71 years old, Am I? no, 74 years old, yes. Now, I'll just show some of his paintings. He was, because he was born in 1947, immediately after the Second World War, and because he was born in Germany, no doubt he was very affected, as his whole nation was very affected by the Second World War, which they provoked. So the guilt the guilt animates the spirit of Ansel Kiefer very, very strongly. But through creativity and assuming, uh, you know, the, 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 the shadows of that world, 
he was able to create a powerful art which is not very optimistic is true but through the very fact that it is highly creative in that i think uh, the positive forces of life won um, there are many layers of meaning in his paintings um, you know these massive architectures that that make you wonder architecture at times at times not always but at times loves massive walls and massive bolts it's about power it's about authority um, you know it can be white like in the in the visions of albert Speer and hitler himself or it can be uh, otherwise but one thing is for sure architecture does collaborate uh, does 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 uh, even in a relationship of complicity with power with authority it always did and it will probably always do so um, he in his own estate he has in france a, a big site where he which he bought and these towers you are going to see a little later in this presentation they actually physical structures on his own uh, in, in his own so-called courtyard, but this is an artwork with them. In general, his art is about destruction. It has ominous meanings. Here we see a pyramid, a construction that, that is supposed to be invulnerable, but nothing is truly invulnerable in this world, even the Egyptian pyramids, not just the, the elements themselves, but also the cataclysms that uh, human beings uh, provoke, like wars. Kiefer is an interesting architect, uh, artist. Why do I keep saying uh, architect? Here he is, the one on the left, uh, a little bit strangely dressed, considering he has a suit and sandals, but uh, artists can be eccentric, so we can for, uh, forgive him for that. Um, another painting by him, you see the, 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 the shadow, the echoes of the war, of the Second World War. Uh, do we reflect enough on what the war means? I don't think we do. And I'm very afraid that sooner or later we'll generate another war. In fact, local war, wars happen all the time. Even between a brother and a brother, even between a brother and a sister, even be between two lovers, wars happen all the time because we are unable and even unwilling, it seems, to achieve peace, to desire peace, to, to want to, to uh, create even a, a, a vulnerable uh, sense of, uh, of, of peacefulness. There is something in us. Now, I do know Heraclitus thought that uh, war was the father of all things and is the father of all things. But I don't know exactly what he meant, meant by war. He certainly could not have meant the nuclear war. The modern war is a, is a calamity which should be avoided by all means. It's enough to think, in fact, tomorrow, in fact, this night, tonight, March 9th, towards March 10th, this very night, in 1943, I think it was 1943 or 1945, I'm a little bit confused, either 1943, but it's possible 1945, Tokyo was bombed uh, in a devastating way. I mean, we know about Hiroshima and we know about Nagasaki, but Tokyo was, was 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 um, damaged by different kinds of bombs. I don't know, 120,000 fire bombers or something like this. I'm not very good with numbers, but I will double check. And I would like tomorrow to talk about this subject because we have to talk about such important issues so they will not repeat themselves again. I think at least 100,000 people died on that night between the 9th of March and the 10th of March. This should never, ever, ever happen again. But I'm afraid it will happen again because there is like a devil in, in the human being that, that makes us unable to achieve that peace which we should strive towards, uh, uh, towards uh, achieving. 
I mean, we see broken glass here in the in the in this installation by Ansel Kiefer. Well, he, you know, if we look at this mammoth, this construction and the broken glass around it, what do we actually see? We see war. We see suffering. We see tragedy. That's what we see, and it's ominously connected with authority, with power, because human beings need badly power you know they suffocate if they don't have power and in the quest for power we kill each other that's what we do here what do we see here again the the the, the vehicle of death this is exactly what flew over tokyo with bombs and dropped them on many 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 civilians who died and i could have been one of those civilians I wonder what the pilot felt. He was doing his duty, of course, respecting his military contract. But think about the consequence that, that, that uh, the, you know, death is at the end. Death. And uh, not uh, fictional, but real. Very much so. So these are artworks, installations by Ansel Kiefer, born on March 8th. And a painting by him, if we can call it a painting. Well, it is a painting which wants to disintegrate itself into coming uh, towards the room with fragments from, from it, from what was painted. Painting is not uh, that bucolic little activity where, um, you know, a dreaming artist paints, uh, you know, uh, uh, scenes of uh, from Arcadia, sweet and consoling. No, art should tell the truth, and uh, this this is the truth that uh, Ansel Kiefer perceived. This is the man. This is the artist. Truly, one of the most important artists today. And he arrived now, I, I read just last night, uh, he did or will do or does right now a, a show at the, in, in the Pantheon. It's huge, right? It's huge. But uh, what does it tell this artwork? Well, I don't know. I, 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 I could venture to, to, to approximate some interpretation, but I will let you uh, you know, look a little bit at, at this artwork and wonder what did the artist want to say. An artist, a good artist, a good writer, a good musician, a good sculptor, a good uh, architect, a good anything should be a witness, a witness to his or her own time. Picasso was a witness when Guernica happened. Uh, I think, I think architects, because of the complexity of their positioning in society, <clears throat> often are less witnesses. I am thinking of, of Louis Kahn, who said, a painter, in order to protest war, can make the wheels of the war machine square. But the architect has to make them round. That's what Kahn said. And I have the highest respect and affection for Kahn. But in this, I disagree with him. I think in the case of war, the architect should also make the, the wheels of the war machine square so they could not run. In other words, the architect should also oppose war, not just the painter and the musician and so on. But architects, very often, they don't do this because of the complicity between them and power, because they cannot build without those in power. So uh, it's, a, it's a difficult uh, situation. But I think when it comes to the gravity of war, the architect should also oppose it concretely, practically, factually, because really, it's about death. And nothing less. And we cannot play games with death. And we certainly cannot provoke it ourselves to provoke so much suffering as if there isn't already enough suffering in the world without us helping it or provoking it. He is a good painter. 
uh, he said, I like vanished things. Uh, obviously, he, he likes, in a way, death. He likes, uh, he likes uh, you know, ruins. He likes uh, things that vanished or are in the process of vanishing. Now, this is a reference, architectural reference to the Third Reich. Uh, you know, uh, imperial architecture that is uh, where the, you know, very easily could be the Ministry of War, uh, where, uh, you know, confused thoughts could come into being and confused decisions are taken, and then millions of people die. Look at that knife in that attic or let's say it's an attic, you know, what could that knife mean? Well, the structure of the building is, is coherent, is logical, is clear. But what is that knife doing that? You know, it's, it's the symbol of, the, of the, the, the inability of man to keep the order he, he creates ordered. And uh, then uh, the, the, the most beautiful structure falls apart. Just yesterday, I showed some um, some churches in in Italy that were ruined by the Second World War. Uh, he also uses flowers, but flowers they are they are they are you know they are they are exhausted flowers, if I can say so. The fragility of flowers, the flowers that lose their their, their freshness because of man. Because of men, the flowers are suffering too, very much so. Art should be taught in any school of architecture and not one year, but all the years, five or six, or doesn't matter how they are. Because without art, what would architecture do? Even Le Corbusier said very, very clearly in his letter to a group of young architects in South Africa, a beautiful letter which I always recommend and where I find myself support when I feel I am uh, uh, dis disheartened by I don't know what. Uh, Le Corbusier says the architect should be the best informed art lover. He knows what he was saying. He knew what he was saying. The architect has to be the best informed art lover, and we are not. I know this for sure, because art history is neglected, is not even taught in the university here, in the schools of architecture. We are ignoring the very essence of architecture, because architecture becomes architecture, or a building becomes architecture, exactly when, at least at some level, it arrives at the status of art. And if, if architecture was not an art, then the histories of art would not contain in their pages architecture. But this is not at all the case. Very, very, very rarely I saw a book with a history of art that didn't contain architecture. Why? Why is architecture present in almost all the books with a history of art? because at its best is an art, that's why. So to me, it is co completely uh, uh, incomprehensible that art and the history of art are not taught in the schools of architecture or are, are taught, uh, you know, kind of like uh, an optional little course obscure that nobody takes and is, doesn't even receive grades, as if it is unimportant. It is hugely important because it is about the soul of architecture. That's what it is about. How could we ignore the soul of architecture? In the name of what? Uh, I think it would benefit greatly if we enliven the hearts of the students of architecture by teaching them, well, the word teaching maybe is not quite the appropriate one, but you understand, by offering the, them the chance to immerse themselves into as much art as possible. That's where the exuberance comes for, from. That's where the, 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 that, that, that intensity of feeling comes from, from the, the artistic side of architecture, not from the other sides. 
I don't think uh, you can become exuberant by uh, uh, resolving, uh, you know, sublimely, sublimely uh, a parking lot or uh, the, the the divine positioning of a refrigerator in a, in, a, in a kitchen. No, no, no. You must have a, a perverse state of mind to become uh, ecstatic. Uh, when it comes to such prosaic matters. Now, the, 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 the exuberance, the exaltation that Walter Gropius thought should uh, uh, transform the craftsman into an artist, and, and, and he included the architect here, should come from, from, from lofty matters, not from prosaic matters. Uh, but uh, this doesn't seem to be understood for some reason, and I don't understand myself why. We need students and architects with open hearts and with idealism and exuberance, we need to, to immerse them in art. It's very important. And even Le Corbusier said it very clearly. And so did uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. When, when Frank Lloyd Wright, he said, a great architect is a great poet, not in the sense that he necessarily writes poems with, um, with words, but in, in the art of building, he or she is a poet. And, uh, and uh, to, arri to arrive at that level, you need to, he, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright talked about an informed heart, an informed heart, not an informed brain. This is very, very important, the distinction, an informed heart. And the heart is the realm of art. Anyway, hello, Mr. Kiefer, and happy birthday to you. Uh, there are those fires there which make me think, but uh, we also see the structure, the charpent, the, the carpentry that, that, that is, it is obtained through the work of man and through his abilities to, to, to project and to build, to make. Uh, but uh, the same man also is capable of destruction and sends the, the bombers above Tokyo and above other cities. Here he is, the artist. Um, he's an interesting artist and an interesting man. And you'll see, um, I hope I have here some images from his estate in France. He has the seven heavenly palaces. These were brought in. I mean, the man is hugely successful. So he's able to create installations that require a lot of, of funds uh, and uh, you know these towers were brought in I think from his estate uh, in France. He also has a large school building in Germany where he works with huge spaces because as you can see he, he does art that requires huge spaces. So just like the intricate labyrinth described by Borges in the Garden of Forking Paths, in which all men would lose their way, in Kiefer's, Kiefer's art, there is always a narrative trap intentionally left that could lead to a cul-de-sac or could open the path to all the possible meanings. Ansel Kiefer's studio at Barjac in South France, uh, this is what I was referring to, and now you'll see some pictures. Uh, now, these towers are not the towers in San Gimignano or not the towers of the Philips laboratories by uh, Louis Kahn in Philadelphia. They are, as you can see, uh, slanted, they are crooked, they are, they are disturbed, they are barely standing. They have to do probably with the pessimism of, uh, of Ansel Kiefer. But he fights this pessimism, or it is actually born from this pessimism through his art. His art is a, is a consequence of his desire to transcend uh, suffering through creativity. This is also on his estate uh, in France. I don't know exactly what it is. It looks like some kind of a amphitheater uh, anyway, this is this is this is certainly not the, the habitual uh, vision of uh, uh, painters, uh, you know, uh, locus. But uh, 
we, 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 we are dealing here with an artist who transcended the vision of an artist painting quietly little squares on a canvas, on a, on a, on a um, chisel. Can art save art? Can art save life? Can art fight off war? Can art win the battle with war? Maybe not. I don't want to be arrogant and say yes. But I think it can attempt to do so. This is what Goya did in his uh, incredible uh, engravings, uh, the disasters of war. <clears throat> this is what Picasso did when he protested war with his Guernica painting. This is what Anselm Kiefer did and does. And I think it is our duty also as architects to attempt to not allow horrible uh, uh, tragedies happen again, because they could happen at any time. And although they might not depend on our will, I think we have to, at all levels, doesn't matter how small, we have to try to, 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 to say no to the horrors that we showed quite convincingly we are so capable of. Okay, and now I go to the last presentation, a short one on the Swiss architect, a Baroque architect, Enrico Zucali, or Zucali, who was born in Switzerland and died in Germany. He, he was active in Germany as a Baroque architect. Enrico Zucali, uh, an Italian name because he came from Ticino, uh, that Italian part of Switzerland. So he was a Swiss architect. You see, he died on the 8th of March who worked for the Vittel, uh, Wittelsbach regents of Bavaria and Cologne, or Köln. This is, uh, in, they are both in, in Germany. This is, uh, this is uh, his signature. And, uh, um, okay, now we look, he completed the work of Barelli, another Italian architect. I don't know if he was born in Switzerland or not, uh, is a major uh, church. Kirche in, in München uh, from 1674, so 340 years ago, 300, almost 50 years ago. This is the church in Munich, in München. And uh, what can we say? It is a church indeed. These towers uh, of this church are very different from the towers we saw in the courtyard, so to speak, of Ansel Kiefer because churches were built with this confidence in the in the in the in the dignity and the, and, the, and the verticality of of the above but that that uh, belief became eroded uh, in later years and maybe especially after the second world war look at the interior it's magnificent and i have all the love that the, that is possible for andrea palladio but i think the interior of this church is better than the interior of the churches of Andrea Palladio. And again, I consider Palladio the greatest architect ever, meaning, um, you know, as an individual architect. But I think in his sacred architecture, he is not as great as he was in, in his buildings for, um, you know, uh, housing estates or uh, you, you can name it the palaces in, in Vicenza or, or those great buildings outside of the city. This, this church is built by lesser known architects, I think is a, is a very fine example of, a, of, a, of a sacred architecture built by Italians, but in Germany. Strange this uh, figure here. Now that I look at it, you know it's um, anyway. Um, so this is uh, baroque, baroque architecture, baroque art. Uh, the architects also contributed artistically sometimes, <clears throat> so they were not just the builders of the building. Uh, 
it is a very good uh, it is a very good building uh, no doubt so these two italian architects uh, built it uh, these ones you know the the one we are talking about today and and barelli who completed the work uh, I, I know nothing about barelli but uh, hopefully i will find out more about him and maybe when the time comes we'll talk about him as well so active in germany but coming from um, either switzerland or, or or italy this whole square was done by them uh, but Enrico, he, he, I, I, mean, I, I couldn't find out uh, until this presentation what exactly he did here besides his work in, on the on the on the church itself. Maybe this structure, which is inspired by a very similar one in uh, in the Florence, uh, but this is the, the a place, a square in in München, which is uh, loved by the by the the the, the, the inhabitants of München because of its Italian uh, spirit or, or character. So we saw today Bakema, we saw uh, Ansel Kiefer, with us uh, oblique relationship with architecture and now we see um, architecture in germany done, done by an architect who was uh, born in switzerland of italian uh, uh, ancestry i think it is nice and fruitful and interesting to cross frontiers between various disciplines this is just uh, an attempt and maybe not the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, provocative one, but uh, I think the relationship be between art and architecture is, is, is to be explored as deeply as possible. Uh, this one, I, unfortunately, I couldn't find pictures. I should have erased this uh, title, but this one I did. Uh, this palace from 1684 to 1689. Um, this is... Uh, you know, maybe it's not very remarkable. Although there are, there is another building that you are going to see. It was also not very clear to me. There are pictures here, sometimes with water, sometimes without. Maybe it was just a flooding. Um, but water is always nice in the proximity of buildings, and you even see the boat, uh, like in Venice. Anyway, the interior is baroque indeed. Uh, and uh, well, the the the, the flat, uh, the the, uh, the slab, uh, you know, the floor itself is is not baroque, but everything else is mainly the ceiling, maybe too much so considering the rest. Another palace in Munich from 1694. Um, this one, an urban, uh, I mean, integrated within the front, uh, the urban front. Uh, of the city, but it it it, it has it has a distinction. I would say it's a fine building, and it's uh, more than three hundred years old. Kept well because the Germans do know how to take care of of what they have. So artists and architects, sometimes they are wanderers, they are, um, you know, they, are, they, they, they travel, they are nomadic people, they, they work in places which uh, recognize their, their talent and employ them and commission them and uh, that's what it is. The Electoral Palace of Bonn, this is a giant building, um, 1697, 1702, later completed by another architect that whose name is there. Uh, but it, it has distinction, it has a dignity. It, it, it is a governmental building, but it, it, is, it is a fine building. And uh, I think uh, the, the landscape in its uh, simplicity adds to its uh, um, dignified uh, uh, grandeur. I 
mean, these are architects. I, I was honest. I knew nothing about this architect until two, two days ago. And uh, I, I still don't know enough. I prepared quickly this presentation as, a, as an invitation to, to maybe explore uh, further. Actually, the, the hidden architecture, as it is called on a website uh, on the web, uh, it intrigues me, you know, the hidden architecture, me, me, meaning the, the, the significant architecture, which is actually less known or not known at all sometimes. And I think there are examples of hidden architecture that are strike, strikingly inspiring, even architecture without an architect, so to speak. You know, uh, architecture can be done even if there is no uh, architect per se. There is a very valuable architecture without architects. But in this case, we do have an architect and we know his name. And he died on this day, March 8th. This is another big palace, which again was completed by someone else. There was this, uh, you know, uh, preoccupation with, with, with such palaces all over Europe and some, more, um, some of the more affluent uh, cities or places afforded to build uh, significant such palaces. Versailles comes to mind all the time and then uh, Schönbrunn in Vienna and there are others. Of course, they were not built for proletarians, that's for sure. But the proletarians now can visit them as tourists. Maybe not now because of the pandemic so much, but before the pandemic and after the pandemic, let's hope it will go away, we'll be able to visit such palaces if, if they inspire us. I personally am not, I'm not very comfortable in palaces. I even at Versailles, I visited the gardens, but not the palace. I never entered the palace. But look here, the building in itself is not so voluminous, but the space around it or in front of it is huge. Large estates, of course. And this might be the last picture, no. But uh, similar to the last picture, we are approaching the end. So if, please be kind and, and if you are still here, uh, be a little bit patient in a few minutes, two, three minutes will end. I wonder why is it that we don't use such figurative, uh, you know, uh, arts or representations in our buildings today? Uh, would, would they be considered too sweet, too, uh, too naive? Maybe, maybe, yes. I mean, could you do something like this in a, in a brutalist building by Bakema? Maybe not. Um, anyway, the intriguing questions, perhaps. So this is the palace, which I have some difficulties to pronounce, but maybe not so big. Schleisheim, Schleisheim palace. And um, I don't know, I mean, the walls are uh, almost disturbingly white compared to the to the paintings, to the ceiling and to that huge uh, painting uh, on the wall. But what can we say? The space otherwise is interesting, uh, at least here where the stair is. And it, 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 it proves again that the staircase is that dynamic reality within a building or without a, a, a building that uh, even because of its function, no, it brings a dynamic quality to the building. A dynamic quality which from the outside is not so obvious, at least uh, in this building. But inside, though, is a different story. The problem today is that our walls are not narrative any longer. At least here, we still have remnants of 
the belief that the world should be narrative. And, uh, you know, those cultures perhaps do tell a story. Those meaning I personally do not know, but maybe uh, those more informed of that time knew what, what they meant. Maybe they meant something. Water is always, uh, always um, welcomed. So are staircases. And so are sometimes uh, painted ceilings. Sometimes. I think this is the last image of this presentation and I, 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 I like it. It's, it's, it's the, this uh, return of the ornament and uh, there is a certain narration here too. It makes you contemplate it makes you remember Lorenzo de Medici, who symbolized Vita Contemplativa. And uh, I think the ornament has uh, the right to come back to an extent, not to suffocate us, as maybe the end of the 19th century did, but at least discreetly at the beginning to have a, a, a return, to come back. No, it was not the last image. Um, now, okay. So we end it today, and I, I, I thank you for uh, for being present here. Uh, let's see.